It's a special pleasure to have uh, Gordy Johnson and uh, Stefan Baudin joining us tonight on Saturday Night Blues. Thank you very much for being here very tonight. Nice to be here, Holger. Thank you. Gordy, it's always nice to run into you um, in various places and, yeah. and under various <laughs> circumstances. Um, I know that uh, that you've got a lot of uh, uh, connections to Alberta. I'll talk to you about that in mm. a little bit, too. But um, you're here today because uh, not only is it your birthday, but uh, you're <laughs> on tour. That's really true, yes. <laughs> celebrating the release of, uh, of uh, Sit Down uh, Servant's new release. It's called... Uh, uh, I was just trying to help, and it's a wonderful new release <laughs> Thanks. that Thanks. Uh, shows a different side, I think, of uh, of your recording career. And I'm just curious how you came to to uh, do this particular record, uh, which you, I guess you would describe as a gospel blues dub record. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could describe it as that. It's not. Uh, I mean, we don't set out to to do that you know like we don't write the list of ingredients down and then go after it um we just make the record and then afterwards people listen to it and go wow it's got this and we can hear a little bit of that these are all songs not all of them but it, the style of the presentation is something that i've been just doing for myself for years and years you know some of those songs are the, some of the first songs i learned to play you know and sing like in my time of dying and motherless children, songs like that. Um, I kind of went back to all that music because I recently had a, uh, I had a surgery on my left hand. I had a severe case of carpal tunnel uh, syndrome, and it uh, rendered my left hand pretty much useless. I couldn't by January of this year. I, I couldn't do anything with my left hand, much less hold a guitar, uh, spoon, toothbrush, nothing, and I'm left-handed. So that made it kind of rough. Uh, so I was kind of looking at the possibility of not playing music anymore, <laughs> which <laughs> I wasn't too happy about that. Had a couple of really great doctors right here in Alberta. I flew up from Texas to consult with these uh, two physicians, and they they gave me a really good you know, overview of what my treatment would be and, and what the possibilities are. Um, you know, there's always a possibility after surgery like that that it doesn't come back, you know, that you're not going to play like I did before, if at all. So that was a gave me some time to reflect on my <laughs> my career path and what I was going to do. At one point I thought, well, I'll just tell him to, you know, just stick a big old metal piece of metal pole on the end of it and I'll just play with that. <laughs> if, if it's not a hand, just give me some. I'll play with a hook if I have to. <laughs> I'm going to play something. Um so part of my rehabilitation uh, as a musician, the doctor was like, you got to start playing the guitar again. Well, I couldn't just jump right back into playing Big Sugar music or anything like that. Uh, so going back to spirituals and traditional stuff and blues stuff, I was right at home doing it. You know, it didn't require the same kind of, it's a different kind of technical ability. I don't want to make it seem like it's easy but it's it's easier for me just because it's so familiar the songs are in open tunings and whatnot as a guitar player that made it a little a little easier i'm playing with a slide for most of it uh, i got my singing back together and gave me something to focus on beyond oh woe is me i might not ever play again or my hand doesn't do what it used to do you know no my hand doesn't do what it used to do but it does something and you know and god gave me a gift to make music and that's what i'm going to do that's it you know, I can't think of a better excuse. <laughs> <laughs> well, the material is uh, is 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 wonderful, and, and as you said, uh, so much of it came from your development as a musician, mm -hmm. what you were listening to at an early stage. Mm. Uh, so would that be a lot of country blues and 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 gospel, as you mentioned? But I'm just curious about the sources and and how you discovered some of these great tunes. You know, as a kid, I didn't really uh, distinguish between what was, you know, electric blues or acoustic blues or folk music or gospel or jazz or any of it. I, you know, when, when you're in your early teens, I just didn't think of it that way. And certainly not at that point in history, we didn't have so many different categories and designations for music. Um, I just listened to all of it. I listened to, you know, Mahalia Jackson every day. And I listened to Mississippi Fred McDowell and, 
people like that. I just it was just all really good music. Blind Willie Johnson, all those, you know, Charlie Patton, all those guys, that generation of musicians, they weren't blues music musicians strictly. They just played folk music, which meant spirituals, some blues songs, work songs, folk songs, ragtime stuff, marches. They played all that. Just anything that you know, they just floated around anything that people might want to stop on the street corner and hear. So we kind of take the same approach. I just grab into my bag of tricks, which for me is a lot of dub reggae, some gospel music, and one chord blues and things like that. You know, I I just drew from what my bag of tricks is without really thinking about... I suppose I could have done an acoustic... I play acoustic guitar, I play banjo. I mean, I can play in the old style of the 1930s and 1920s blues man. You know, I can do that, but that's not strictly me. You know, this is electric guitar, and I got Stefan playing the drums the way we like to hear drums and the kind of rhythms that we like. We're not trying to copy, you know, an old Muddy Waters records, drum parts and rhythms and things like that. We have our own vocabulary, so we try to just stay within our own. This is what we can do sincerely, you know. Mm -hmm. Um and playing the bass pedals, not to just exclude a third member from the band, but whatever shortcomings my guitar playing might have now due to my limited uh, dexterity with my left hand, I just feel like if I'm covering it with the bass pedals at the same time, no one has to try and follow me in what I'm doing. I can just stay on one chord as long as I need to till I can get to the next one because I'm going to play the bass with my pedals. So it's kind of like... A jazz organist who plays the ba the bass pedals and then comps and solos on top of that. I'm like, well, I could do that. So mm -hmm. I developed a little bit of a thing <laughs> that way too. Stefan, yeah. how did you and uh, Gordy start playing together? Uh, well, we met uh, I think ten, twelve years ago. Yeah, at least. Yeah, yeah. at least. And Gordy produced uh, two records uh, from my bands in in Montreal called Respectables. Oh yeah. And uh, that's when, you know, early, I think, late 90s, late, yeah, yeah. 99, I think. We, see, we, we met and we started playing uh, together and worked together with my band. And then later on, without my band, my own project together. And I joined Big Sugar two years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, now uh, it's a sit-down servant. And, uh, <laughs> Are you still based in Montreal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am. Yeah, Great, yeah. And as far as... Um, how the material developed from your perspective as a drummer, percussionist. Um, did you uh, did you spend a lot of time kind of you know woodshedding this material? And no, not really. <laughs> because <laughs> actually, Gordy called me and he says, "Well, we're going to do uh, this project. Do, do you are you into it? Do you want to do that?" And I say, "Sure, sure, I want to do it." So okay, I'm going to think about when we can get in the studio and do a record. We have to do record material, and then. Uh, and then he called me back. He said, well, you know, uh, I've been listening to some of the recordings of your drums that I already have. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking... The drumming was already done. Yeah, it really <laughs> it's was. pretty much there. So, uh, so he basically sent me the record, and it was pretty much me playing on it, but I didn't have to show up in the studio. It's, we only it's did it in a couple of days. Really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because I already had the drums recorded. It didn't... You know, I just sat down with the pedals and the guitar and the vocal mic and did each song once, maybe twice. My engineer was like, well, that sounds really good, man. I'm like, okay, cool. Mixed it and sent it out. We got a, we got an offer for a, a gig uh, opening for George Thorogood on his Cross Canada tour. And uh, none of my bands could do it. You know, Wide Mouth Mason wasn't available. Grady wasn't available. My hand wasn't completely well yet, and I thought, oh, man, I really want to do that gig, though. There's got to be something I can do. What if I do it by myself? And the agent said, well, man, it's got to be, they want a band. It has to be electric, and it has to be a band. I said, well, all right, then I'm a band. So what if I'm a band? Then what? Like, well, what kind of band? It's going to be a <laughs> blues a uh, band with some gospel music and maybe a little bit of dub reggae. Okay, well, George's agent thinks that sounds pretty good. Um, so they like it in theory, but we got to hear some music. I'm like, well, what time is it? It's 2 o'clock. 
<laughs> All right, uh, how late are you in the office? I called my engineer. I was like, Jacob, meet me at the studio at three, man. Went to the studio and just like set up a vocal mic, plugged in a guitar amp. Man, we just just went for it. Just recorded two songs <laughs> as fast as we could. Sent it back to them. It was in their you know email inbox by midnight. Recorded and mixed, and we got the gig. We got the whole tour. And I thought, wow, we got a whole tour. I better call Steph. Steph, we got a tour, man. Uh, we need to, I guess we should finish the record, make a whole record. So I got in and spent another day, made, you know, finished the whole record like that. Because if we're going to go on tour, man, we might as well have something to, you know. So it, yeah. got, it got, got my mind focused on that instead of moping around the house thinking how much my hand hurt, you know. And that's, I didn't, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't able to play for very long at a time and i thought this will get me something to focus on i went back in the garage and practiced a little bit every night playing the bass pedals and playing stefan and i got together and rehearsed and man just give me something else to to focus it's my quite something on. to see gordy like actually like playing the bass pedal doing the guitar and s the singing at the same time it's like it's quite something it's a spectacle spectacle in itself <laughs> <laughs> Stefan, you've seen Gordy produce records for 12 years now, yeah. and and uh, and the, this new project was done incredibly quickly. Uh, has that always been kind of Gordy's method of, of working with bands and musicians? Is capturing that uh, with us, uh, with the Respectables, my band, when we play, when we work with Gordy, it's pretty much like uh, he set up this our gear and we play live and he just capture us you know we go through the songs he arrange the songs with us go through the lyrics with the the singer and you rewrite some of the stuff and when it's everybody knows pretty much where it goes then you press record and we just play and try to get the the performance right but yeah it's usually it's uh, it's not uh it's uh it goes pretty fast you know it's uh mm -hmm. we're going for it when once it's time to play, you know, everybody's going like, yeah, go. You know? Yeah. Do you have a philosophy about producing that uh, that you adhere to? Well, yeah. You can't... Th the trick is you can't adhere to it. You can't be stuck on your, your technique. Because it's not the same for everybody. Some artists require a more intensive kind of, you know, one little part at a time and build build up a song that way. Um, so I try to stay adaptable. It's just my job is to read people and read artists and figure out what's going to get them. How can I get, keep them inspired and get obstacles out of their way? You know, because if they're, if they're in their element and there's a free flow of ideas, you know, it'll just go better for everybody. Everyone will be happy, hopefully. Other times what the artist wants to do isn't necessarily the best way to get there. So then I've got to be a bit of a diplomat and, you know, get us all on the same page in terms of how we're going to get where we want to go. You know, Because it, it shouldn't really be an artist's job to figure out all the technical hows and whys, you know. They tell me what they want to do. They tell me, you know, what they imagine it to sound like. And then I need to think of the best path to get us there. One of my favorite productions that you were involved in with uh, was the uh, the Taj Mahal, the two tracks on the mm. Maestro album with uh, Taj backed up by the New Orleans Social Club yeah. uh, collection of absolutely legendary New Orleans players. Uh, what a pleasure it must have been for you to to be able to work with players on that level. Yes, it was a pressure. Oh, did you say pressure? Or pressure? <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of pressure, man. I, I showed up in New Orleans with uh, Warren Haynes of the Allman Brothers and Government Mule, called me up and said, hey, man, I'm working on this Taj Mahal thing. I want you to come and sit in the chair next to me, man. I really, it's going it to be a two-man job. I thought, well, all right, Warren's my guy, so I'll go help him out with that. And, man, it was not long after Katrina, so New Orleans was still upside down. You know, there was just dead cars, part, like piled up 20 cars high, just piles of burnt out cars that I saw from the flood, you know. They just had uh, all, under all the underpasses, parking lots, just full of dead cars. So it was a surreal kind of time to be in New Orleans. And uh, the studio was a bit makeshift because, of course, people had lost a lot of equipment and there weren't a lot of studios up and running yet. So the place we went had been spared by and large. So it was a kind of a weird time to be there. And 
I, I tell you that you know the guys from the meters. I mean, Taj, all those guys, they've known each other for 40 years, and they're still fighting about the same stuff they were fighting about in 1973. <laughs> I mean, they're arguing about who paid for the gas when they were on the Rolling Stones tour in 1978 <laughs> or something. You know, I mean, it's, it's kind of funny to be in a room full of guys like that who've got, woo, there's something else going on here I'm not really privy to. So I just kept my cowboy hat down and went about my business putting microphones on stuff. And... um that was definitely a case of, like, I walked in there and I listened to that. I listened to Raymond Weber play his drums. I thought, this man don't need but three microphones on his drums. And I put up the microphones, and he kind of looked at me like, "Fool, what are you doing? I, ain't you gonna put up the rest of the microphones?" I like, I don't reckon you need any more microphones. I'm gonna let you mix yourself. And he does. I mean, he just hits the drums the way you want to hear them. I'm like, well, you gonna do the job for me, man? I just Put your drums like three microphones. Don't need no stereo. That's it. Just like this. Oh, he was so, after that, he was so proud of that. He was like, yeah, man, I mix myself, mix my own drums. <laughs> like, all right. Uh, the whole session was like that. I was like, Taj had a bunch of like little just pe effect pedals plugged into his guitar. And I thought, oh, man, I want to I hear Taj Mahal. I don't think I want to hear all that. Warren Haynes is like, Gordy Johnson, I wish somebody do something about that effect pedal he's got on there. I thought, oh, you're going to make me be the bad guy, huh? I thought, well, I might have to, I might have to go home my first day on the, on the job. <laughs> but that's, I want to hear Taj Mahal. So I walked out on the floor and I said, Taj, I'm hearing a funny sound on your guitar, man. I, I pulled, pulled that pedal out of there and just put the cable straight into the amp and I railed it. And as soon as it started the feedback and all distorted, he just like, it's like he turned into the Howlin' Wolf. He just started playing this filthy guitar riff, and the whole band went. Doo -doo 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 they just, I was like making the roll the tape, man, roll the tape. This they're not going to do this again. Just roll the tape. <laughs> Ran back to the control room. So, you know, I had to take a few calculated risks in terms of getting fired, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> Leo Nocentelli, the guitar player of the Meters, is a huge influence on my playing. I love, I love the guy's music. And he had the same thing. He had a bunch of these little effect pedals in front of him. And I thought, oh, man, I can't, I can't do that. So I went out there. I said, Leo, uh, how about we, uh, I don't know, do you have a wah-wah pedal? Leo Nocentelli said, yeah, that would be funky. <laughs> Leo Nocentelli <laughs> said, that would be funky right to me. That's it. Okay, I'm good now. I can go home now. That's that's my payment in full right there. So I unplugged all his junk and plugged in the wah wah pedal and he was right, man. It was funky. He was the king of that. You mentioned Warren Haynes mm. and the partnership you've had with Warren and the productions that you've done together. Mm. Um if we were going to play an example of something that was truly magical, uh, of you guys in the studio, what do you think that should be? Oh, of me with, with the mule? Wow. You know, one of the things I'm most proud of, oh, man, this because it's a blues show, they, there's a song on the last Government Mule record. The record was called By a Thread. And there's a song, there's a track on there called Inside Outside Woman Blues. We did three different versions of the, of the song. And we just didn't have the heart to to leave any of them on the cutting room floor. We made, we ended up keeping all three of them. And they're live performances. The vocal is is live. The The whole band just tracked it live off the floor. And that was just one of those nights you had to be there to, to witness this all go down. I think we had just got, before we did the take, we someone sent us a text message saying that uh, that Mitch Mitchell had passed away. Hendrix is drummer from The Experience. So, that had a profound effect on everybody, you know, it just gave us a minute to think back about Jimi Hendrix and Mitch Mitchell and all that. And uh I don't know, it cast a spell on the on the room. And that that was just one of the most uh experimental and I mean it could have been a three minute song, but it's like an eleven minute song <laughs> as a result. And uh fantastic live performance at Government Mule. That I'm pretty proud of that one. 
Can I ask you about a couple of songs off the the, uh, the yeah. Sit Down Servant sure. record that you're especially proud of? And and I know one of those is uh, Blackbird Bakery Pie Blues. Blackbird Bakey Pie Blues. Bakey Pie Blues. <laughs> 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 How did that come together? If, uh, if I were the blackbird, would you bake me in your pie? I don't think I need to explain much more than that. If you need it explained to you, go ask your mom and dad to <laughs> sit you down and tell you about that. Yeah, that's. Uh, I wrote that with uh, a good friend of mine from Vancouver, uh, Rich Hope, who's got a great, uh, uh, great band going on. Uh, Rich Hope and his Evil Doers and. Um, I've always been a big fan of his music, and we've worked together a lot. He's co-written some Big Sugar songs with me as well. Um, so Rich came down to visit me in Texas, and we hung around all day and wrote a couple of songs, and that's just one that I had in my back pocket forever. And uh, so as soon as we were sitting down to make this record, I thought, oh, man, I'm going to pull that one out again. In My Time of Dying? Yeah, In My Time of Dying. That's that's one of those songs... Uh, you know, traditional songs, that it's one of the very first ones I sat down to learn to play. I was just haunted by that melody and, uh, and also the the subject matter of the song. You know, that sort of a, you know, especially given that I'm sitting around and thinking about my own health and welfare. <laughs> um, you know, you start thinking about your own mortality a little bit. So I had to uh, include that one in the, in the mix. Mm -hmm. yeah. This may be the last time, which has been covered by a lot of great people. I think Fred McDowell did that, maybe did he? Yeah, I've uh, got staple singers. Uh, yeah, I'm a, especially fond of the staple singers. Yeah, version of that. I listen to a lot of Mavis Staples. I, mean, I just love Mavis and Mahalia Jackson. Uh, and actually, when we got the phone call to uh, to do the George Thorogood tour, they're like, <laughs> "Well, we need." What's the name, name of the band? <laughs> we need a name for the band. And I'd been listening to the Staple Singers. I just happened to have been listening to the Staple Singers on my laptop, in my iTunes. And I'm thinking, a uh, name? I'm um, scrolling down through song titles. And like, um, a name, how about Sit Down Servant? Yes. That's going to be the name of the band. I called Stefan up. And I was like, what do you think of that? St sit Down Servant? He goes, I, I don't know what it means, but it sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> so as, as I was on the phone with the agent, I'm checking, like, you know, copyright, you know, who, who holds the domain name on the Internet, all that stuff. It's like, it was clear, it's good to go. Fill in your credit card information here. Okay, good. I, I own it, and we are sit-down servant. That's it, in about four and a half minutes flat. Uh, so we're sit-down servant. I love that the way the staples saying that sit-down servant. That's another traditional song that dozens and dozens of people have covered but i just i love the whole concept of the song the whole lyrical bent of it. that that's us right now it's, we just got to heaven and we can't sit down so that's the name of the band stefan something that uh, jumps out for you from from the record perhaps uh yes i like the moody one like the the bakey pie blues and the dripping springs is also a good one but there's a funky one called uh, if you think your god is dead that's pretty good as well. And one called Wrapped Up. Uh, that's more of a blues uh, traditional. Uh, it's pretty good, yeah. You're both, of course, still in Big, big Sugar, and uh, there was a new Big Sugar record that came out last year, and, and uh, uh, Evolution of Big Sugar is still constantly going. Uh, mm -hmm. Stefan, uh, do you have some Big Sugar plans that you can share with us? Oh, yes. Well, we'll be playing uh, this summer. We're going to be uh, doing some festivals around Canada. Yeah. And then we might be doing another Canadian tour like, like we did last uh, fall, like two months on the road. Yeah, we did October. 44 cities yeah. last fall, and we'll, we'll do that again this fall. We just It was like a two-month-long family reunion. Man, we just had the best time. And seeing fans and friends out in the audience, the same thing that we haven't seen in 10 years. It was such a, such a great tour. It's going to be busy for Big Sugar as well this year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great. Got to get healthy. That's why. See, I got to get healthy. Gordy, you've spent a lot of time in Alberta. Um, Medicine Hat, I believe, uh, is, is where you spent a lot of time. Yeah, we've got a farm in the Red Deer area as well. We still, yeah. we still have some land there. So, you know, there's lots of families scattered around the province. So I'm going to visit family means coming here pretty much. Great. Yeah, for me. I also just wanted to ask you about um, 
you spent a lot of time in Windsor, of course, and, mm. and grew up in Windsor, and and the proximity to uh, Detroit and and all the great music of so many kinds, you know, in Detroit. Yeah. Did you find yourself going there very much and and being part of the Detroit scene when you were living and growing up in Windsor? Yeah, I mean, even as a kid, I used to, I mean, as a teenager, you wouldn't you wouldn't get away with this now, but you know, I was thirteen years old, fourteen years old. 35 cents I could ride the tunnel bus over and I'd be in downtown Detroit 35 cents didn't need no ID nothing just get on the bus and then you know the bus come out of the darkness and into this whole other world so I used to run around downtown Detroit like we own the place you know it was just our playground kind of uh and went to go hear music whenever whenever we could and you know all through my developing years as a musician Detroit is where you went to to see music and to play. So that, you know, I'd, I'd spend weeks at a time over there. You know, we actually the played Detroit uh, with uh, Big Sugar yeah. on the last tour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much uh, to both of you. I really appreciate you doing this and sitting down for Saturday Night Blues and sharing all, right. all this great information, and especially about the new record, uh, Sit Down Servant. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot.